you join me today at the wheel of an insanely rare hot hatch from the 90s. I mean, really, it's a forgotten hot hatch from the 90s. This is a Sayet Ibiza Cooper Sport GTI, and I'm really quite liking it. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. So here we have a 1999 Sayat Ibiza, a Mark III in the UK, a, a YK2 type, I believe is the internal designation for these. What's is well, it's very shiny and uh, oh, it's got GTI on the front. Is, is that everything? No, I think there's something else. I think the badge on the boot looked quite interesting as well. Yeah, let's have a listen to this. This is quite interesting too. Can you hear that? That doesn't sound like a super mini engine. Mm. Let's explore. Yes, uh, under here we have... Well, it's a Seat engine apparently. But it's a 2 litre Seat engine, a 1984cc if you like. Uh, 150 horsepower in this tiny little thing. Isn't that the formula of muscle cars and hot rods? So basically we've got a muscle car Sayat, a tiny, tiny Ibiza with a big two liter engine. Oh, and that sounds like the 1990s to me. This sounds like a beautiful, normally aspirated, non-turbo, simple engine with a lot of oomph behind it. Now the reason we've got this great big engine in this tiny car is because it's a Ibiza Cupra Sport GTI or Sport GTI Cupra Sport Cupra GTI Cupra. Basically, yeah, it's one of the three names in it. This is a rare beast. This is possibly the rarest car, in fact, I've ever had on the channel. Currently, there are two registered in the UK on the road. There's another 24 uh, off the road, so in sheds, in pieces, likely never to see the road again, potentially. Oh, who knows? So certainly likely to be less than 10 drivable right-hand drive Cooper Sport GTIs left. Now this wasn't the only ridiculous hot-rodded version of an Ibiza. There was also the Cooper R, which had the 1.8 turbo in it and churned out 180 horsepower. That's what I thought. Now underneath here, it all looks very, very 1990s with the, the lack of covering of the engine. You can see the block itself. You can see the spark plug wires. Um, you can see all the cables and everything else just, just here in the engine. It's a, like a nice car to work on, like cars used to be back in the 90s. Uh, you can see the, um, the ABS system here just sitting on the back of the bulkhead with all the uh, brake lines visible. Obviously a VW Group header tank because they're in so many cars. It's got a VW logo on the, uh, on the cap, so it really is a VW Group header tank. Who knew? Um, well, me for one. Now the Ibiza got a pretty major facelift in 1999 when the uh, grille changed and the uh, badge was enclosed in a central body coloured section for the first time rather than being loose on the radiator grille. So this makes this a pre-facelift car. Now being the Cooper GTI Sport, Cooper Sport GTI, Cooper GTI, this has got lots of extra bits that make it a little bit cooler and stand outy. It's all very subtle and if you don't necessarily know what you're looking for, you could easily pass this by without even noticing. But you do get this big lower air dam, you get the front fogs and you get the great big side skirts down below the door that really can make the car look a bit more beefy and aggressive. It also looks really good in this kind of racing red, which is a bit of a step on from the earlier Cooper Ibethas which were all in that uh, kiwi lime I think they were called or kiwi green. Oh, that's a good thump on that door, isn't it? Right, let's have a little look around the inside of this car. Well, obviously it's based on a Mark III Polo. You can sort of see that from the dashboard and the just general shape of the thing as well. It's not a big secret really, is it? It's no, there's no big revelation just there. But Sayat did make the car very much their own. They did as much as they could with the switch gear and the buttons and the door handles and everything else to, to turn it into their own vehicle. Now, in terms of what the actual spec of the Cupra Sport GTI were, it's a bit of a grey area. Now I do a lot of research on these things, I spend a lot of time on the internet and if I've got books I'll go through the books. But there's virtually nothing about this particular specific model online. Uh, there's a Cupra forum um, which covers this car and they had a quite a long multi-page discussion about what they thought the spec for this was. And this is various owners all comparing their cars and they're all different. So some would say, yes, I've got aircon, but no sunroof. I've got sunroof, but no aircon. I've got, some had door speakers, but no uh, dash speakers, dash speakers, but, but no door speakers. Um, on the Series 1 cars, the pre-facelift cars, they had different fabric on the seats. They had what they call the tiger skin fabric with this mad kind of slashy pattern. Um, 
So yeah, there was lots of changes between the first and the second generation and individual cars as well. It almost seems like whatever was in the parts bin that week, they would throw in a car and send it out. So yeah, very little information to go on. Well, as always, let's have a look on the door to start with and work around from there. Uh, there is one area of fabric embellishment on the door, which is this little stripe fore and aft of the door handle, which has got the same kind of swoopy, tready, footprinty pattern as the seats have got. And that's on both front doors, obviously. That'd be crazy if it was only on one. Um, and this is where things get very interesting. This door handle is all over the place. You've got a grab handle you put your hand through in the front. This looks like some kind of um, gym equipment. Then you've got a little kind of pockety, wishing well, um, rock pool area here where you can pull it as well. And that's all molded up into this door handle up here. So you can yeah, open the door. Uh, yeah, lots of weird sculpture going on here. This is, it's one big curve going from back at the bottom up to the front at the top the curving back on itself and it's all over the place what a door handle wow I, you know i've been in several mark 2a facelift slash mark 3 i beat it in the past i've never really noticed just how complex this door handle is before wow well above and below this whole area of amazement is uh, some thick uh, rhino hide plastic um it's got like a leathery molded effect but it is quite a hard brittle plastic um, and that has got a big door bin down there actually it's a very large door bin in the bottom of the door and a big door speaker as well that is our our door there's nothing else on there no buttons no switches or anything that's all kept to the middle of the car i guess to save production costs between left and right hand drive cars i would imagine also cabling runs out to doors are expensive as well keep it all in the central dashboard save a fair few pennies doing that so nothing else up there move over to the big dashboard here um, I can't tell you how good this tea shelf is it looks spectacular I and mean, that looks like the greatest tea shelf uh, ever huge flat expanse I can't even reach the furthest reaches of it um, but because there are no cup holders in here and because this car is quite a special one of two on the road um, I didn't bring a cup of coffee here because I didn't want to spill it um, so yeah I can only I can only imagine how good that would be to put a cup on there are speaker grills in both corners and little air vents blowing out onto the windows. And as I mentioned, not all of the Cooper Sport GTIs apparently got dashboard speakers. But this is quite interesting, the way this kind of comes across here and then it's like a sheer drop. It's a cliff face of a dashboard swooping down here. You can imagine this little kind of action man guy, James Bond almost, um, skiing on this relatively safe plateau and then plunging to his doom in the footwell because that just drops. Uh, I can't think of many other cars that do such a severe drop like that. Uh, but yeah, anyway, coming back to the instruments and things, uh, in this corner here, we've got a very, very, very tall air vent for matching on the passenger side as well, a vertical thin thing which rotates left and right and uh, can also be vented let up and down as well. So you've got full control of this huge, great air vent. And just coming, stepping back in from that, you almost can't see it from the driver's seat. It's kind of hidden behind the uh, stalk for the wipers. Is the uh, switch for the lights. Is a typical, certainly on many, many Sayats. It's off, then side, then dip, and then you pull it out two clicks for the front and rear fogs. Um, but below that, you've got angling for the headlamp adjustment, if there's weight in the boot, and also for the brightness of the instruments on little turny dials. But that's weirdly faced away from the driver, even worse than the radio in a marina. It's bizarre the way that's just punted over there almost so you can't see it and over to the left of the instruments you've got a bank of four switches uh, rocker switches well I say four there's one switch to the rear screen heater uh, there's an indicator light for the airbag being turned off and there's two blank ones for things that aren't here so yeah I don't know stuff then we've got the dials racing dials obviously because it's a racing car and you can tell that because they are white and only sporty cars get white dials that's the law apparently it's a 140 mile an hour speedo which is 220 kilometers per hour and to its right is a rev counter which uh, red lines at six and a quarter thousand rpm and it's actually a little bit of silverness into that white as well so it's quite quite uh, exotic almost i can also tell you apart from the fact that there are tiny sub dials for the temperature on the left and the fuel gauge on the right this car has only done 69,000 miles it is a absolute peach of a car um, I know it belongs to a heritage collection and it was bought by someone who was looking for a very nice one and he found it um, and the clock panel on the right hand side is also multifunctional so uh, this little button on the end of the, the stalk for the wipers will also give you oil temperature something to do with uh, pyrotechnics and centigrade I should probably find out what that means in the handbook 
Now coming back towards you, we've got a big button for our hazard warning lights, which glows when you push it. It's very, very obviously uh, Mark III Golf um, switches for the uh, wipers and uh, indicators and flashing headlights and gubbins. Then what again looks like a Mark III Polo steering wheel, but with a Sayat logo in there and an airbag. Passenger driver's airbag, but no passenger airbag. Horn check. Yeah, it's quite a sporty little horn, isn't it? And that is the main section here. But, lo and behold, it's not all there is here because there is a second driver's side glove box down here. Oh, this has got the owner's manual. Oh, I can find out what explosives mean. Um, I'll read up on that later. Maybe I'll flash it on the thing because there's a lot, a lot of book there to read. That's useful. Not many cars have got a second driver's side glove box. I, mean, I can think of the Rover P6 and that's kind of it. Right now, in the centre, um, we've got two more big air vents which are blowy all over the place. And we've got our Sayat sound system. This is the original radio. And check out all the angles on these buttons. This is, I guess this is an aim at being sort of tactile so you can find your buttons in the dark and without taking your eyes off the road, you can sort of feel that here's the uh, indents for the one, two, three station buttons and the up, down and all the rest of it. Cause it's just all over the place. Oh, it's, a, it's got RDS and Ian uh, radio cassette with Oh, CD it's got a CD changer controller in it as well. What if there's a CD changer in the boot? We'll find out in a second. Now, below that Sayat sound system, there are the three dials for the heating and ventilation, uh, because that's all there is. Um, we've not got a recirculate button, as far as I can see, and we've not got air conditioning, so this is your lot. Speed, temperature, direction, get over it. And below that panel, there's another panel which has got all the controls you would normally expect to find over here on the driver's door. We've got the adjustment for the wing mirrors, and little individual buttons push left, push right to choose which one to adjust. The outer extremes of these five rocker buttons are the electric window switches. And then there's three more blank panels. Why do I keep getting cars with blank panels? Um, blanked off switches everywhere. Uh, this is the top of the range virtually, so why am I getting so much blankage? I can tell you why, it's because it's the sporty race one and things like air conditioning and a sunroof add weight. And these cars were often specced by people who were thinking of taking them on track days. So they wanted the least weight possible, either to drive them in their full road form on a track day or to strip out at a later date and go full on track racing in them because this is where Coopers came from. This wasn't the first ever Cooper, but not far into the range. The first Cooper was called the Cooper Kit Car and it was a rally car and it did really well in the two litre front wheel drive class on the World Rally Championship. In fact, it won that class in 96, 97 and 98. So uh, when they started doing Cooper road cars, um, there was some pedigree to back that up. Now, underneath what might well be air conditioning and sunroof buttons, we've got two things. We've got a 12 volt socket with a lighter in it, and we've got a Beale Sweetie Wrapper tray slash ashtray, which slides out. And that's uh, room for many miles by wrappers. Underneath that, we've got a vast, great big cubby hole. Where you can lose your hand in there or your sunglasses. Then we come back to the gear shift. Five speed manual in this car, which is not a bad shift. It's a little bit rubbery, but not bad at all. And in front of the gear shift, we've got the 1990s obsession with coin holders continuing. I think you get six little coins stacked vertically in these little slots down here. They loved a coin holder in the 90s. And so that is a leather gear stick with a leather gator because this is posh and this is a leather steering wheel as well. So all the good fancy bits are in this GTI and also leather handbrake because GTI too. And over to the left, we've got yet more storage. And you'll notice there is a big glove box here which has got more uh, history for the car in here. Well, I say service history. And that's quite big and it has got extra cup holders so we can have a cup of tea going on there. But we've got more storage down here. It's another little cubby hole we can just stash bits and pieces. They're just putting stuff everywhere. This is a very, very practical car. Having said that, there's no central armrest and there's no uh, little cubby in it because it's not there. So yeah, that's the end of the practicality. We've got a couple of little uh, sun visors here. Both sides do have a mirror, which you can cover on the driver's side, but not on the passenger. And we've got a couple of little courtesy lights, a reading light and a courtesy light. And I will just quickly mention the GTI seats. They look a bit Recaro-ish in their style and their bucketiness. And they've got, as, as I mentioned, kind of strange 90s, like a half open you know, footprint and a tire tread pattern going on in the central fabric. And because these are GTI cars, they've got GTI emblazoned in the back of the seat. Let's have a quick climb in the back. Well, this is the three-door version of the car, so I'm having to flip the seat forward to get in here in the back. And actually, it's not a bad space considering it's not a big car. Headroom is quite impressive. Got okay legroom, okay tow room. 
there's an armrest molded into the side molding and there's a little ashtray on the driver's side not on the passenger side and these windows do actually flip out um, they don't open vertically but you, do, you can just wind out the rear corner get a bit of fresh air in there are seat belts for three there's uh, three points on the outer side and the uh, middle one gets a lap belt and there's a couple of grip handles with little coat hooks but that's kind of it as far as the back is concerned. I think there's loudspeakers in the rear castle shelf, not in the sides here. Um, it's not bad space actually, it's quite comfortable. These seats feel like they've never been sat in to be honest. They're very, very smooth. It's not quite velour, it's a, it's a soft felty fabric, velour-ish. Now here at the back of the Cooper Sport GTI, which does look a little bit like someone's bunged a GTI badge on the bottom of a Cooper Sport car, uh, we have got the body colour bumpers, the twin exhausts, this rear spoiler, and I do rather like this kind of full width light cluster thing, which has come back into fashion again now, uh, 20 odd years later. And stepping inside, there's actually a pretty decent boot in here. It goes down a really long way. You can get a lot of uh, luggage in a car like this. You've got 60-40 split folding rear seats, so you can fit more stuff in there if you need to. And underneath the floor, a space saver spare tire, which looks like it's never been used. This car feels absolutely like a proper old school 90s hot hatch. Even the performance figures put it in the old school 90s performance hot hatch territory, 0 to 60 is about seven and a half seconds. It'll plow onto about 134 miles an hour. And everything about it has got that kind of real delightful, lovely old school feel. It's a proper normal aspirated, non-turbo, two liter engine which likes to rev quite happily. Oh, it's got a lovely burble, that crisp kind of induction sound and a deep burble in the exhaust. This is a car from a different age and I have to say I kind of love it. Under the skin it's got McPherson struts and coil sprung suspension at the front and uh, torsion bars and coils at the rear. And that gives it a nice soft but grippy ride. This is exactly how sports cars felt 20 years ago. Back then a performance car wasn't sprung so hard that you'd shake your teeth out. I know there's a lot of people do kind of complain that new cars are too hard, if they're, certainly if they're sprung for sportiness. Back in the 90s, they weren't. They were really quite softly sprung. So I'm going to put the fan on a bit. I apologise if you can hear the fan, it's very warm today. Um, but for a sports car, it's based on a lowly sort of little shopping hatchback kind of thing, albeit a very good lowly shopping hatchback kind of thing, the handling and performance are brilliant. It really does grip beautifully and you can throw it into a corner and it will just stick and stick and stick. The gear change is surprisingly light. You just sort of flick through the gears with just a moment's resistance as you sort of change from the the upper plane to the lower plane or you know the forward and back plane and it just drifts straight in after that. The steering is obviously power assisted but not to the point that you notice it and uh, when you chuck it into a corner it's very neutral it just kind of grips and grips and grips there's a slight smidge of understeer waiting to happen more than anything else. It's quite a neutral, well-balanced car. You can see why so many of these Cooper editions were sold as potential track fodder. That's why this car's got no air conditioning and no sunroof. So many of these cars were bought by people who wanted to take them on the track days and use them on the track and they didn't want the extra weight or the hassle of welding a sunroof up in three years time when the finance was paid off. Now, as I said earlier, this is one of the hardest cars I've had to review. Not because I've got no opinions about the car, I think it's a really good car actually. I'm really enjoying this and everyone who's seen this car has also instantly fallen in love with it. Everything from the condition of it to the look of it to the rarity of it. But uh, in terms of finding stuff to say about it, this has been really tricky. I mean, normally I will fill two or three sides of a big notebook with lots of trivia. I can tell you who designed it, I can tell you how long it took to design, I can tell you where it was built, how many they built. But in this particular case, none of that information seems to exist. I've been on the Cooper forums and there's lots of opposite information of, and everyone really just comes to the conclusion that they didn't really keep records. 
and uh, they built them with whatever options they had on the shelf that day. So it's a bit of a random thing. When things were different back in the 90s. And that impressive acceleration does make it a very usable car even today, 21 years on. Uh, pulling onto the motorway, this thing easily keeps up with other traffic. And if you need to change lanes and blat away from something in sort of mid-range, it's got tons of torque. And for such a light little car, it just flies. This is sort of like driving my Rover Tomcat in so much as that big engine, light car, lots of torque. And just, yeah, it just really, really goes. The difference is, of course, that this doesn't rattle like my Tomcat. Even on the motorway, I was about to say as we're driving at 70 miles an hour on motorway, uh, but we've gone into a 50 mile an hour limit, so we're now doing um, 50 miles an hour on the motorway. Um, it's lovely and smooth and quiet. It's like a really relaxing thing to ride in. And that is the key to a great performance car. You know you're in a good performance car when you can drive it slowly and it's still enjoyable. And looking at the dashboard and the controls, this is a world away from the current generation of Ibiza, which is all touchscreen, CarPlay, lots of you know, infotainment going on. This is really basic. I mean, I think electric windows were an exciting feature back in the 90s in a car of this size. So coming off the motorway onto a fast roundabout, you don't have to rein it in, you can keep the power down. Or you can slowly go behind a couple of Volkswagen Passats. I, I know most of the hot hatches from the 90s. I was into hot hatches and muscle cars and all that kind of stuff back then and still am now, obviously. But I just don't remember this car being an option to buy even then when it was new. And I obviously remember the um, various like, Fiestas, Novas, Metros, Peugeots, all of them. But I just don't remember, I don't, I, kind of the Coopers maybe just weren't on my radar until things like the, the Leon Cooper in about 2000. This one, I just don't remember ever seeing on the road before. For. I'm gonna lay a little bet with you guys as well that you probably haven't seen one either. If you have seen one, then mention it in the comments below because I, I genuinely don't think I've ever seen one of these in the wild. This particular car belongs to Sayat's Heritage Fleet, so it's uh, maintained by, um, by Sayat UK to a very high condition indeed, I have to say. Uh, the paint is just so glossy, your hand almost falls off the door handle when you try and open it. This is exactly the kind of driving experience I love. A car that's light, nimble, but with gallons of power at the front that's just willing to go and oh, just puts a smile on your face all day long. But at the same time, it's not so stupidly fast you're gonna lose your license in second gear. And I know obviously for very obvious and important emissions reasons, engine sizes have been changed down to sort of one liter 1.1s with the turbos. And the performance is as good, if not better, in terms of numbers on the page. But there's just something about this old school, heavy, thumping two liter that just, oh, you can't replace it, you can't replicate it. Maybe it's something to do with the weight of that block up the front, or the slightly initially slower revving and then building up to higher revs. It's just different, it's just completely different. Now you guys won't be able to see this, but just behind me there's an XR3i convertible. We are now driving in the 90s. I do feel I'm sitting a little bit high. There is an adjuster to the left of the seat, but I've not been able to make it adjust particularly while I've been sat in it. got decent visibility out all round. The uh, Mark III Polo switch gear does feel a little bit, um, well, weird. it's very solid and good, but it feels kind of curvy and a bit too, too bubbly considering everything else is very square and angular. And these are little bubbly, nice curvy things. As you're blatting through the back roads, the white gauges are really easy to read. And uh, with the headlights on, because I don't want the car to get driven into, obviously, they've got little orange glows from the top. 
people often ask me what is my favourite car I've driven so far on the channel or ever and I'm always, I mean always, at a loss because I've driven so many cars and so many of them were, were brilliant um, but this has been an unexpected leap into, yeah, the, into the hierarchy, the top 10 it's definitely a contender for one of the most fun cars I've driven in a while it's very, very very nondescript it, because the overall body shape it, it's so ordinary if you like big old two litre engine in it it's completely changed and the really subtle changes like that little lower lip on the front bumper those black side skirts down the side just utterly transform it and so it's just a nice under the radar performance car in terms of build quality this thing's over 20 years old and you hear that you hear how rattle free this thing is say it's actually really well screwed together so as far as forgotten hot hatches go oh look at that jag Whoa. as far as forgotten hot hatches go they don't come much more forgotten or indeed hotter than this and the interesting thing about this car maybe it's the sort of smiley face maybe it's the bright red color maybe it's the fact it's just such a little tiny tiny thing it just puts a smile on everyone's faces everyone who sees this car loves it young old boy girl it doesn't matter everyone who sees this car thinks it's really cool Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this astonishingly rare and so much fun little Sayer, this hot hatch, this muscle car from Barcelona. Oh, it's fantastic. I don't want to give this car back. Oh, never mind. I'm going to have to hand back the keys very shortly. And I'm not going to enjoy doing that. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video as half as much as I've enjoyed driving the car. Uh, if you have, please smash that like button, smash the subscribe button. I'm trying to get to 100,000 subscribers before the end of 2021. Let's be realistic here. Uh, and uh, yeah, join me again next time when we'll be driving something completely different.